All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to yet another uh, Lifespan.io Journal Club. And I'm Dr. Hal from Medvedic uh, presenting um, this month's journal. So um, this is our first journal club of 2022. So still the year of our pandemic, um, sort of, kind of. Hopefully it's all petering out, right? So um, and hopefully this will be the, the last of it, um, as long as not something doesn't, doesn't pop up in Pennsylvania, because a little bit of news from the United States, we just had a tractor trailer overturned with 100 experimental macaque monkeys that were released into the Pennsylvania woods, and the CDC is advising all people to stay away from these monkeys because they might get infected, and I am not kidding. <laughs> so that, that is, that is uh, what has just happened in 2022. So anyway, um, now for some good news, we have a wonderful paper here to present that um, I'm pretty excited about the technology here. Um, it actually uses some of the same technology that is used in the um, current iteration of the COVID vaccines. Um, and um, I see a lot of potential for this, uh, for, for targeting um, senescent cells, for example, and, and a, lot of other, a lot of other potential therapies. So it's a, it's a really, really cool, I think, technology paper. And it's a short paper, it's a, it's a science paper. Um, so, um, what is this paper all about? So let's kind of jump into it. Um, well, before we jump into the paper, let's go into a little bit of uh, background as to, uh, what this paper is going to be discussing. Hold on a second. Let me find my right presentation here. Um, oh, here it is. Okay. So, shit. Uh, let's see. Is everybody, let's see, let me go from slideshow to beginning. There. Can everybody see that title? Cartoon. Ah, all right. Awesome. So that is that is the title of the paper that we're going to be presenting today. Um, CAR T cells produced in vivo to treat cardiac injury. Um, so what are CAR T cells and why are they being produced in vivo and why specifically are they being used to treat cardiac in injury? So this is a Rurik et al. paper that came out fairly recently. Um, I think it came out this month. I'm not 100% sure. Very recently. Um, there's a, we did a blog post of it on, um, on our website, uh, forgot who actually did the blog article, Steve might know. Um, and this is from UPenn. Um, so basically the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and a lot of authors here. <clears throat> so CAR T cells are an exciting bit of technology in of themselves. Um, some of you may have heard of them, if not, um, they're really awesome. They're basically a game changer that's being applied to, uh, cancer biology and basically cancer therapeutics. Um, so CAR basically stands for chimeric antigen receptor. So basically um, what this therapy involves is you isolate a patient's white blood cells. Um, you take them out, you get them in, in vitro uh, and then you modify them and you genetically modify them. So you are basically genetically engineering a patient's cells. Um, and you uh, modify these T cells to basically now recognize um, a surface protein on a cell that you wish to target. Um, and the, the application that's being used predominantly is basically for cancerous cells. Um, so after you basically propagate these modified cells um, that basically have a specialized receptor, a chimeric antigen receptor on the surface, you infuse them back into the patient, right? And um, they have been now permanently genetically modified. Uh, they circulate around, um, and sorry about this fuzziness here. I got this from online, but basically this chimeric antigen receptor uses a modified antibody domain that can bind to basically something that is, you know, um, let's say predominantly expressed on a cancer cell. So one, one thing that you need to do is you need to find what your target is, right? So you need to identify, um, a cell that you wish to target and what is, what is going to be very specific about it as far as a surface marker. So let's say B cell lymphomas highly express this CD19 marker. So if you generate antibodies against it, you could make this chimeric antigen receptor that is chimeric because it has a binding domain and then it has an internal signaling domain inside the T cell. And this signaling domain will trigger once it binds, will basically tell the T cell to once a binding has happened, um, to become cytotoxic. So if it's a CD8 cell, for example, it will, um, it will induce cytotoxicity and kill these cells. And there's been kind of many iterations of these, of these um, uh, chimeric antigen receptors um, to basically modulate the signals. Um, and I kind of won't go into detail about it um, because that's not the point of this journal article. 
Um, but that is that is a technology that has been around now. Um, gee, I can't remember. Don't know exactly when this was invented. Um, I want to say definitely within the past 15 years, probably not even 20 years old, certainly taken off in the past 10 years. Um, and it, this is out of the experimental stage. There's a lot of uh, a lot of different cancers are being targeted right now. So, so this is the this is basically what this paper is using. They're using CAR T cells um, uh, to basically treat uh, cardiac injury. So they're going after cells that basically are fibrotic. If you remember many many journal clubs ago, um, you know fibrosis is this condition where um, cells. Uh, damage that happens, particularly as somebody gets older, does the right tissues don't basically, um, right cells don't actually um, are utilized by the body and, and the repairs that happen are sort of patchworky. So you get fibrotic tissue that is kind of not functional. So these CAR T, -T cells are being produced to basically target these fibrotic cells, um, these fibroblasts in, in, heart, um, in heart muscle. So that's the basis of this paper. Um, but there's another, cool aspect here, and that's the in-between part of this title, which says in vivo. Um, so CAR T cell therapy, the way it's usually done um, is you isolate the cells from a patient, and then you modify them in a Petri dish, and then you put them back into a patient. Um, and they're genetically modified. And in this case, you really want them to stick around because, well, I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's, pretty good in this case, because if you are, have a tumor or you have a cancer, um, you still have circulating T cells that can hunt and kill any kind of loose cancer cells that kind of are, are around. So you have this um, long lasting response. Um, but there's kind of two issues with this. One is that A, you have to isolate the patient's T cells. So it's a pretty, you know, this is a pretty arduous process here. Step one, two, three, getting isolating the cells, modifying them in vitro, putting them back into the patient. Um, and what the authors in this paper have done is they've come up with a method to do this in vivo. Um, so they're using a mouse model here. So they're basically modifying these cells directly in the mouse without actually taking them out first. So that circumvents all of these steps here of purification. Um, the other thing they do, which is cool, is that they're not genetically modifying these cells um, by in, directly in the genome, but they're using um, the, uh, a messenger RNA to temporarily um, have these T cells express a um, chimeric antigen receptor. Um, and why would they temporarily do this? Well, um, as the author state in the paper, um, fibrotic cells, um, you know, the fibroblasts basically are used kind of quickly in the body to repair damage. So if you have a wound healing response, you want it to heal pretty quickly. Um, so you want to get rid of the cells if there's too many of them, but you don't want this to be lingering in uh, a host organism for a long time, right? So you don't want to completely be obliterating fibroblasts like for a long time. So by adding in messenger RNA, this is a short-lived response. So the authors say you can kind of tune it by, by basically modifying, you know, and they don't, they, they mentioned this in the discussion, but you know, um, they don't kind of go through all the different iterations, but obviously you can modify messenger RNA to have different types of longevity um, by basically giving it a different uh, phosphodiester backbone and so on and so forth. So this is the two things that they do that are different. Um, and this is from their paper. So what do they do? Um, so how do they get these, um, how do they get uh, this technology into, into the cells, into the T cells? Well, they use these lipid nanoparticles, um, which basically encapsulate various uh, RNAs. And this is basically the technology that's used. Um, this is how the messenger RNA is essentially delivered um, using different proprietary lipid encapsulations um, in uh, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, right? In this case, in, in those cases, you have the viral spike protein that's being expressed. Um, and I do believe that these um, vaccine um, delivery systems don't have any, any kind of targeting system, right? So they kind of, you know, kind of go randomly, they combine to random cells. Uh, but in this case, uh, these lipid nanoparticles have been actually engineered to have a anti-CD5 antibody expressed on them um, through, um, I'm not exactly sure how they get it in there, whether it's basically um, 
uh, you know, vortex in when they make the lipid nanoparticles, or if it's also expressed with messenger RNA. Probably, probably it's inserted in because I can't, I don't think there's an expression system inside these lipid nanoparticles. But anyway, these are now directed towards T cells. So these CD5 is basically a cell surface marker for T cells. Um, this promotes endocytosis of these lipid nanoparticles. Uh, the messenger RNA gets basically now um, released inside these T cells and translated. And what do these messenger RNAs um, express? Well, they express a chimeric antigen receptor. And specifically, they, they call this thing a fat car, which is basically a fibroblast of, I believe it's fibroblast associated protein. Um, so yeah, and, and chimeric antigen receptor, right? So that's the term for it. It's the fat receptor. So that is, that, is, uh, that is then expressed on these T cells and that is the car. And this now directs these T cells to bind to activated fibroblasts, which have this uh, fibroblast activating protein on the surface, right? So that is, I'm gonna stop sharing. That's the technology and that's the background in a nutshell. And what the authors do in this paper is um, they demonstrate the technological platform and, um, and how it may actually uh, function. So um, let me take a pause here. Anybody has any questions? Um, I, I think I think that this technology is pretty cool because what we discussed in the past was we discussed targeting senescent cells, and of course you have senolytics. You have you have small molecules that can induce um, uh, the clearance of senescent cells, and then we talked about ways to target senescent cells using kind of the nuclear option and an antibody that basically had. Uh, I forgot what it was. It was an alkylating agent that was quite potent and that caused death of senescent cells. Um, but this is really kind of the most sophisticated approach for targeting cells, really. Um, yeah. yeah, so for what it's worth, I, I did some digging on how exactly they made these because I was really curious about that. And um, it's not very hard. They're actually using pretty old technology to put these, to functionalize these LMPs. Mm. Um, they they, um, it, they just take their nanoparticles and they mix them with a steric acid derivative. So like a steric mm -hmm. acid and a melamid on it um, that can react with stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's just entropic mixing where like you combine your steric acid with your particles and it just sort of sorts itself in. Mm. And then you have a melamid, which like in conjugation chemistry is a handle to put on all sorts of stuff. Um, so it's... Like if you have a decent lab set up, you could, a lot of labs could do this. Um, it's not like make, making the particles is hard, but functionalizing them, that's not, doesn't seem that hard. Yeah, basically it's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of like kind of rigs for that, but I probably, what do they, do they even use um, sonication or some sort of other type of, you basically just randomize it, you mix it and you, you get, you get particles of a certain size. And I know there's, there's other, there's other types of, uh, techniques you can use to then isolate, you know, particles of a certain size range. So then you know that you have a certain, you know, um, quantity of messenger RNA, whatever your, whatever your cargo is, right? Mm -hmm. And then you just, then, then you use it in your, in your experiment. Oliver, maybe I missed this, but some fibroblasts, of course, are essential for both wound healing and for regeneration yeah how do you distinguish that you're only killing ones that are in the way or doing the wrong thing in the wrong place yeah they they, they mentioned that and i i think um so i think uh well it's kind of a dosage response here um and also they mentioned that they don't want these particles to be around a long time so that's why they do this messenger rna lipid nanoparticle, um, because they mentioned, they mentioned that if, yeah, if you have these particles floating around for forever or for a long time, you're, you're going to, you're going to knock out wound healing or have some other types of issues. Um, so, um, I, you know, in this case, they're going for these fibroblast activating protein on the surface. Um, you know, if, I'm sure, I'm sure if they got more sophisticated, they could probably, they could probably also modify the CAR T cell to, to bind to some other cell surface marker that's maybe, you know, preferentially on cardiac tissue. I don't know. I don't know what that would be, but, but this is, this is kind of their first iteration. And yeah, um, it, uh, that, that, that is a concern. Yeah. It's an interesting start. 
Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so this is, you know, um, and, and, you know, I, again, they're using it for, for um, uh, cardiac tissue that's been, so in their model here, which will go into the paper, um, they damage the cardiac tissue by using um, angiotensin, uh, angiotensin two, I believe, which promotes an inflammatory response and another uh, molecule, uh, I can't recall what that is right now. Um, so they infuse mice with this, it causes, um, uh, cardiac injury, um, and then basically fibrotic tissue, and then they then they um, treat the mice with these with these lipid nanoparticles that have the uh, CARFAP um, you know molecule that's uh, expressed. So uh, let's take a look at this. Um, all right, so that's their paper. Rurik et al. Um, and this was what we just looked at here. Um, and what they're doing here is uh, just basically flow cytometry expression. Um, so they're doing first in vitro work. So as, as per usual in most scientific papers, you kind of start with the, with the foundational but boring stuff first to make sure that their particles are actually getting into cells. Um, so they have several things they have. Um, so they're doing, so right here, this is from a fluorescence activated uh, cell sorter. Um, so, uh, so they're using transient, so they're CD5 targeted lipid nanoparticles, um, and murine T cells. So one thing that, <clears throat> so maybe somebody can chime in on this. Um, so they're using a CD5 receptor. So they're targeting, I believe all or most T cells, right? So I don't think they're differentiating between CD4, or CD8, cytotoxic, helper T cells. I think it's going for every, every T cell in this a, a few A few Bs too, probably. Like yeah. it's, um, it's lymphoid uh, lineage. Mo mm. Like I think it's mostly T, but that's about as specific as it gets. Mm -hmm. so, um, <clears throat> so they basically look at, so, you know, the, they look at cells that are percent fap car positive. Um, so they have several controls here. Um, the blue is essentially um, what is the blue here? So this is uh, the lipid nanoparticles just have IgG. So it's not specific for T cells um, containing uh, lipid nanoparticle FAPCAR, which is basically their you know, messenger RNA. Um, then they have CD5 targeted uh, with GFP. And then they have CD5 targeted with the actual LMP FAPCAR. Um, and then they have, I guess, a positive control, which is a retroviral FAPCAR, right? Which is basically um, targeting the, the fat car gene directly into the genome of, uh, C, of uh, T cells. Um, and then in E, they do a, uh, a killing assay. So basically a FAP fibroblast activating protein expressing target, um, I think what is this, human embryonic kidney cells, HEC293 T cells overnight and assaying for killing efficiency. I haven't read up the assay, how they use it, probably staining the live dead assay. Um, and so as you can see here, you know, um, obviously you, you know, you have significant targeting, um, you know, more than 75% fat car positive cells, um, much less so, right, with the controls. Um, and then you have a pretty robust, higher than, you know, higher than background killing efficiency, although you do have, you know, uh, you know, some non-specific killing efficiency with some of the controls here. Uh, but you do have a much higher uh, killing efficiency using these um, CD5 targeted um, lipid nanoparticles that express messenger RNA for fat car um, in their in vitro assay, All right? So I don't know if there's any comments that we basically have here. Okay. So that's their assay. So, you know, Steve? No. Uh, I was just about to say, I've just looked at Facebook. We've got no uh, comments or questions, but if anybody does, um, we are looking at the Facebook chat as well. So feel free to join in. But uh, I can only imagine that your explanation thus far, Oliver, has been comprehensive and, as always, excellent. Boy, okay. Text in the mail. Thank you. Uh, um, so that was in vitro. So what do they do next? They do in vivo. So these are CD5 targeted LMPs, which is now we're getting into um, 
kind of the interesting stuff. Um, so they have, um, so they inject these um, intravenous injections. So these are in mice uh, with sort of AI6 mice. I'm not familiar with these mice. Um, um, so again, they have a control, which is lipid nanoparticles that have IgG. Um, and these have are expressing basically uh, luciferase. So basically they wanna see if these lipid nanoparticles that you know have either CD5 or IgG can get into splenic CD3 plus cells. And I think CD3 plus cells are, um, again, these are, I don't know how many B cells have this, but this is primarily a T cell marker. And of course they also look at um, CD4 positive and CD8 positive, which are helper cells um, and cytotoxic T cells. Um, and what do they look at? ZS green. So this is a another control. Again, this is just to see how well this is targeting cells. Um, this is they basically isolate the spleen, which there's um, a lot of um, immunologic cells there clustered as part of the immune system, um, and quite a lot of luciferase activity, right, compared to the controls. Uh, CD3 minus, so cells that are that are not uh, CD3 plus, so non T cells. Um, have pretty low targeting. So they use another control, which is the ZS green. Um, I believe it's a it's probably fluorescence protein, right? That's targeted to, um, to a locus in these mice that basically have a, have a site that can be targeted using Cre recombinase. So they have these lipid nanoparticles that are um, targeted to the locus. Um, and you basically have preferential targeting of these lipid nanoparticles um, after you after injection. And this is this is after 24 hours, right? So luciferase activity and ZS green expression observed in 81% of CD4 splenocytes and 70, almost 76% of CD8 splenocytes, um, but only 15% in CD3 minus splenocytes, right? Um, so this is within uh, 24 hours, and these are the amounts that they used. Um, and um, what else did they do here? So any questions thus far on targeting efficiency of, of this to, to the cells? Okay, uh, so right now, um, they're isolating T cells from spleens of these mice that have been injured. And I mentioned this earlier with angiotensin II and PE. Um, I don't remember what PE is. Um, I have to scroll through here. If anybody remembers what PE is. So it's, I know it promotes an inflammatory response. Um, I don't think it was in the, in the uh, figure legend. Figure two. Gosh darn it. Looks like it's phenylephrine. Phenylephrine. Does anybody happen to know what phenylephrine specifically does? <laughs> kind of know what angiotensin does, but phenylephrine. Um, some sort of toxic mm -hmm. compound. Well, uh, isn't it going to increase blood pressure because it works like adrenaline? I don't know. Um, that, that, that would make sense. If you basically, it's a hypertensive, right? Increases blood pressure. Yes. Well, the, the other one promotes um, an inflammatory response. So that would make sense having a combination of these two compounds, angiotensin II and phenylephrine would, would be bad. Um, okay, so uh, try and remember um, this control here. So these are in mice, the T cells are isolated spleens of angiotensin II phenylephrine injured mice. 48 hours after um, injection. So saline as a control, IgG, LMP FAPCAR, which does not get into the cells, uh, or at least very little, um, CD5, LMP, GFP, and then CD5 targeting um, the T cells with LMP FAPCAR. Um, so again, um, high percentage of FAPCAR positive cells. Um, I think they're gonna do this later. I'm not sure why they had to do this, this particular experiment in angiotensin to uh, phenylephrine injured mice um, rather than, uh, um, yeah, 
I'm not sure why they had to do this particularly, this, this cluster of two figures here in, in uh, angiotensin II phenylephrine injured mice. It certainly plays a big role later in the figures because you want to see that after angiotensin II phenylephrine injury, you have fibrotic tissue forming in the cardiac and you get basically targeting of these cells to those loci. But um, I'm not sure why is this necessary actually here? Um, well, regardless, um, you do have a much higher percentage of APCAR positive um, uh, of cells uh, using these lipid nanoparticles targeting T cells. So, um, so that's good. So any questions here? So three and four is when we actually get to seeing what these cells are capable of doing. Um, and this is going to have to be a word that I had to look up. Um, so FAPCAR T cells, tragocytose, FAP activated cardiac fibroblasts. Um, I know, I know, um, uh, pardon me, what, oh, oops, never mind. <laughs> Coming in. Um, so they so tragocytosis is basically like a kind of a nibbling or a munching on cells. I'm not really sure. You know, phagocytosis, the cell gets completely engulfed, right? Just basically chomps down on it. Um, cells can endocytose things, small things from 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 the uh, from the in, in environment, right? And 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 uh, tragocytosis, um, I. I guess the cell is basically just munching away, right? It's slurping at the at the plasma membrane of another another cell. Um, yeah, I have to admit this is the first time I've heard the term trigocytosis. Um, anybody here is uh, anybody here is basically familiar with the concept of trigocytosis? I had to look it up too. It, it, it sounds like it's a behavior bound to immunological synapses, which I'm a little more acquainted with. Yeah, so it's like an immunological synapse, but then. It's not just synapsing, but it starts to kind of, like, I guess it kind of slurps the surface receptors off of the cell and, and kind of incorporates them. So this, this basically this pink cell here and B, so here's a diagram, here's your T cell, here's your, here's your um, a red fluorescence protein uh, that's conjugated to, I guess they made a modified uh, fibroblast activating protein with the RFP molecule. Um, and, and the cell just kind of nom nom noms on the on the surface, and uh, you can see this arrow pointing to basically RFP particles basically getting kind of slurped off. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I guess I guess that's I guess that's one mode of killing. I wasn't familiar with this mode of killing for T cells. That tr that tragocytosing is is a way for uh, the T cells to basically um, attack cells. But there you go. So, you know, trigocytosis is, is, is basically happening in FAPCAR T cells um, that uh, bind to, um, so let's see, what are these modified cells? So this is um, confocal time-lapse uh, microscopy. So these are actually HEC293 cells that have been modified, right? So they're using this in, in vitro, but then I think they move on to in vivo. Um, and this is cells that are um, in animals uh, from spleens, right, uh, that are uninjured and injured animals. Um, they have MIG R1 control. Um, I have to admit, uh, I forgot what MIG R1 was. Um, so they have control T cells. And I think the, the white area that's highlighted is white pulp regions are VAP stained spleens. Uh, so we have control. Uh, which is basically control is no, no damage, no damaging agent. And then angiotensin II and uh, PE is your damaging agents. Uh, then of course, control T cells, which aren't expressing FAPCAR. Uh, and then you have your FAPCAR GFP cells. Uh, and then you have your angiotensin um, uh, being added. And then you have your angiotensin plus PE plus FAPCAR GFP T cells, which basically will um, will fuse with those cells. Um, and I'm not really familiar with the with the layout here because I I don't know if this should be kind of reversed because if you have so wide field images of FAP stained spleens of, of an uninjured animal 
uh, after adaptive transfer of 10 to the 7 MIGAR1 control T cells, um, and then an uninjured animal after adaptive, adaptive transfer. So I believe they infuse these cells. So I don't know if, so I don't think they're actually doing these lipid nanoparticle. Um, this is not, this is not quite uh, the, um, they're not infusing these lipid nanoparticles, I think yet into these animals. They've been modified and then infused um, and see whether or not they would basically um, interact or bind with uh, your angiotensin to PE cells. Um, so I'm, taking a look at this highlighted region, and I'm not really 100% sure. So these are fat stain, stain, uh, fat stain spleens. Um, and you definitely have a clustering of your, you know, your, your CAR T cells um, in this region here, but, um, Maybe somebody can basically, if somebody has a better understanding for why this region here is going to primarily have your angiotensin II PE damaged cells in that region versus the outer region, um, I'm all ears. Um, okay. So uh, in D, they do confocal micrograph of, so the white pulp region is spleen of an angiotensin II PE injured animal after adoptive transfer of these Falcar GFP cells. Um, and you basically show that these, you know, um, that these uh, T cells are essentially uh, these Falcar GFP. Yes, let's see. T cells are fusing with, uh, with, with cells that basically are expressing, um, as we mentioned before, your, your fibroblast activating protein, right? So here's basically, uh, you know, the uptake process of the troglocytosis. So tro how do you pronounce that? Troglocytosing, troglocytosis, troglocytosing. So troglocytosis is taking place, right? So basically you're having troglocytosis taking place um, on cells that um, are uh, expressing uh, fibroblast activating protein. So uh, the most kind of, finally they get into the actual um, live animal study here where they induce damage to, um, to C57 black six mice um, using the angiotensin II PE, wait a week after damage has been done, um, inject with the lipid nanoparticles that have the CD5 LMP um, and, uh, and then and FAPCAR and then basically uh, look at the physiology of the mouse and see whether or not they have any of these endpoints uh, that measure cardiac efficiency, um, whether or not there's an improvement. And lo and behold, um, there is. So they look at, um, and I'm not a cardiologist, but they look at diastolic volume and systolic volume. I know that systole and diastole is basically your heart is pumping away, so I believe. Systole is the high pressure and the diastole is the low pressure, right? When the heart squeezes and, 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 you know, and contracts and expands, right? So you get, you basically, you know, in general, you want, you want a kind of a, a lower pressure or you want more volume during each stroke, right? So that's basically a healthier heart. So the more heart muscle you have every time systole and diastole happen, you basically can, can squeeze more blood around. So it's more efficient. Um, and then various other parameters, such as ejection fraction, which is, I believe, the amount of blood coming out of a, um, I think, somebody can correct me, out of, a, out of a blood vessel, like an artery, right? So this is all basically uh, global longitudinal strain. Um, what else do they look at here for DE? Um, weight normalized LB mass. Um, and... Oh, ejection fraction refers to the efficiency of the heart being able to squeeze as much blood as possible with each stroke. Right. And they do they and they they and and they measure that by by what like the amount of volume of blood that comes out of a uh, out of a given period of time. That that well measured the amount that comes out in one beat versus the volume that was inside the heart before it started squeezing. Ah, okay. 
So, so they, so basically, these are sort of the, the most important um, endpoints uh, to, to look at. Um, and impressively, um, you have improvements, right? So, you know, um, and diastolic volume. So, I believe that these are uh, these are significant. Do they have the p values here? I think they do. I think they're all um, p values shown are from two keys post hoc test. One p is less than 0.05. Okay, so you have uh, several mice here. N equals seven. N equals seven. N, N equals eight. Um, and you have improvements. So red is red is your your CAR T cells have been modified. Um, saline and saline, um, which should be your you know your positive control and your or your negative control, and then you have your um, orange, which is basically damage with saline, so no repair, right? So uh, so you do see improvements uh, throughout, and this is a not familiar with how to measure this here, H representative M mode echocardiography cardi images. So this is probably some sort of um, using some sort of a sonogram to basically look at, I'm not really sure what an echocardiogram image is. All I can say is that looking at this, <laughs> these two look more similar than the middle one. So I'm assuming that's an improvement, um, but I've, I'm not skilled in echocardiography. So I'm not really, I'm not really, uh, uh, can't really interpret an echocardiogram here. I'm, I'm not super confident myself, but I think that's how they get their ejection fraction data by looking ah. at the, um, the, the echocardiogram looks like it's time series data, right? Um, yeah. So I, I think when they're like getting ejection fraction, it's comparing like troughs to peaks in uh, panel H, but I, I, I'm guessing, so. Yeah, yeah, I could just basically, I'm basically looking at it. I'm like, yeah, this one up here looks like this one on the bottom and this one here looks a bit like not so good, right? So I'm just, look, I'm just doing a, just, you know, it looks like, it looks like treatment with LNP FAPCAR looks like your, your control that's not damaged saline saline, much more so than your middle, which is your damaged saline, right? So it looks like a more normal-ish echocardiogram, right? So um, that's the best I can do. Um, and then of course they do now um, histology. So they look at quantify fibrosis. So they do cross sections of heart. Um, and here's your saline, saline, angiotensin two, um, and PE damage, and you know saline. So no treatment. Um, this is st staining for, um, I believe it's, uh, I forgot what stain it was, but it was a stain, I believe, for collagen or some other, um, um, some other marker of basically fibrosis. Um, it's the stain that they use. Not critical. Yeah, this is a this is picrocerius red. This is a really Fairly easy to use, intense stain for fibrillar collagen. Mm. Um, it's, I think it's the it's the best stain I know of for looking at fibrosis. Okay, so that's the stain they use, and um, and we could see it there. And angiotensin two, BAPCAR. So they look at so basically they you know box a region and they quantify the amount of um, space taking up uh, by the by the you know the collagen staining, um, and it goes down. Right, so um, so basically you have an improvement. So figure four is sort of like the you know sort of the culmination, obviously, of, of, of the paper where they actually inject these lipid nanoparticles, you know, after time one week after basically inducing cardiac damage. Three weeks later, they do an analysis. Right, um, I'm going to stop sharing. So it's a pretty short paper, um, but I think it highlights, and I'm not sure. Um, I, you know, the, the, I think this might be the first paper where they do a transient CAR T cell therapy, if I'm not mistaken, I think. Um, every other CAR T cell therapy has been a genetically modified cell um, that's been removed in vitro and then put back. So I think the two, two main things here, well, besides applying it to fibrotic tissue, is the two kind of the major developments here is that it's a tr it's a transient um, mRNA based um, system and um, just as cool if not cooler it's an in vivo system for generating CAR T cells right. so they're not extracting these cells out of a patient or in this case a mouse they're putting these lipid nanoparticles injecting them directly in there um, and you know 
kind of stepping back just from its application to longevity research, which is using, using modifying this technology to you know, attack senescent cells transiently, um, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, this, this may be an awesome way to really kind of make um, our T cell therapy much more um, uh, widely available and cheaper, right? Because you don't, not really, you don't have to isolate uh, a lot of cells. Um, if you're using, if these lipid nanoparticles can be used to target um, T cells in vivo. Um, uh, so anyway, that's, I think it's pretty cool on kind of multiple levels, um, this technology. Um, and like you said, Michael, some of the, some of the ways to do it, like with generating these lipid nanoparticles themselves are pretty straightforward. So, um, you know, this is a, this is a, it's really cool when you see a technological platform kind of, you know, I'm not going to put this in the same category yet as, um, you know, as CRISPR Cas9, but you know, um, you're, you're, you're achieving the same results using a way easier methodology here. Um, and it gives you some flexibility too. Yeah, for, for my money, what's really most exciting thing here is just the very effective demonstration of targeted lipid nanoparticles where like pro one of the biggest problems in gene therapy I can think of is just specificity or tropism. Like there's a lot of ways to deliver gene cargos to the, to a, a, the human body, but mm -hmm. aiming them is really hard. Yeah. Like stuff that's in clinical trials right now usually uses one flavor of adenovirus or another that has that kind of sort of has tissue specificity, but you kind of, you have to hope that an adenovirus exists that um, targets the right cells. Um, and there's all this amazing stuff with the banana particles, um, especially with mRNA cargos, but how, how do you target those? Can you target those? And this is the first paper I've seen that actually tried that. And the fact that it's, they're doing that for CAR-T makes it even cooler. Um, yeah, I didn't know that. So I didn't know that was the first, this, this is potentially the first targeted lipid nanoparticle. Paper. I, I'm like, not can, sure. Can there might that? be others, but it's the first one I've read. Um, wow. So, so, so if it's, if it's not the first, then it's probably one of the few, definitely. So, and that, and that's been successfully in this paper demonstrated in mice and in vivo system here. Yeah. So I was spending a lot, a lot of my attention was aimed at the figures where they were talking about specificity, like their, their panel 2B where they're looking at how much uh, signal they get in CD3 minus cells. Um, I, I think that's like the specificity data that they're showing in uh -huh. the main part of the paper. Right, and, right, right. This um, one here. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's clearly not completely specific, but it's there's a whole lot of enrichment for their CD4, CD8 over their um, CD3 minus cells. Yeah, I haven't I haven't looked at the supplemental, and I'm not sure if they looked at all other tissues to see if there's non-specific targeting, right? So they actually did this. Oh, they did. Um, so they, they've got this luciferase vector, right? So they can, they can do that type of experiment where you just have like whole organs and you see what lights uh -huh. up. Um, it's a uh, figure S two A. If you uh -huh. got it, I don't um, have it on, uh, uh, up here. Unfortunately, I have to go download it. But let me S two A. Okay, um, let me. I could actually pop it up if you want. Yeah, please. If you could throw it right into the. Or you, actually, let me see. I think you have sharing capability, or you could just throw it into the, into the chat, and then I could share it. Well, it's it's uh, might be paywalled. I don't think I don't think the supplemental is paywalled. Actually, it might not be. Usually, they keep that open. Uh, give me a sec. Let me see if I can dig it up. Uh, this looks right. Yeah, this 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 paper. I thought this paper was like I had access to this paper. It was not paywalled, and then it was paywalled. So I don't. I, I apologies if people couldn't access it, but it um, it was S two. You said right. Um, oops. Uh, this PDF download. Okay, let me just let's take a look here. Downloading. Two seconds left. Okay, let me share my screen. Yeah, it looks like it's down on page six. There, there it is. 
Aha, uh -huh. there we go. So this was kind of, I, I when I saw this, I, my first impressions were there's, there's, there's good and there's bad. So like you've got tissues where you definitely don't expect, so, okay, so you, you do like intravenous injection of, of liquid nanoparticles, where does stuff go? Um, I think you mentioned this at the beginning, Oliver, Gen generally these therapies go to the liver mm -hmm. and then to a lesser extent, other organs like spleen and they show the liver lighting up like Christmas. There's a whole ton mm -hmm. of stuff that gets, um, their, their cargo ends up there. They also get some delivery to the spleen and like all the, most of the, a lot of the assays in their paper are spleen. Um, they don't see anything in like lung or kidney and that's good. Like you don't want anything. Mm -hmm in lung or kidney. Um, my big question here is like, when they see their liver standing, wh what is that? Like, are those, so there's gonna be some lymphocytes in the liver. Right. Um, are you staining those or are you staining hepatocytes? Um, right, that, right, right. Like, and, and maybe that's okay. Like maybe if you're delivering CAR T to hepatocytes, that's like, hepatocytes don't have the, cellular infrastructure to use those. So maybe that's okay. But on the other hand, like maybe that's not okay. <laughs> um, I feel yeah. like that's what, what I'd really be interested in, like in a follow-up paper, um, like yeah, how well, much this... of this is targeting off target cells in the liver. Yeah. Well, it just seems like just in general things just go to, right. Cause they got the, the IgG LNP luciferase, which is non-specific. It's just all going, being dumped into the liver. I mean, more so the CD5, but there's a you know, m way more than, you know, everything is going, you still get a huge background in the liver. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what's going on with the liver with, uh, with the huge enrichment, even not specifically. Um, so then, then it becomes the issue. It's like, can you really, uh, you know, can you really, uh, can you really cut that, you know, how 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 can you attenuate that right to a great extent if 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 things are really going to the liver non specifically to such a high level, right? Um, but doesn't appear to be the case for you know for non specifically for anything else, which is pretty good. Um, you know, obviously you can look at muscle, you can look at brain, you could do a bunch of other things as well. But this is pretty pretty promising. Um, so. So yeah, so um, so yeah, re really, really like I don't want to say all of these are firsts, but maybe a first in combination, right? So transient, transient generation of CAR T cells, transient in vivo, in situ generation of CAR, you know, CAR T cells, um, specific targeting of lipid nanoparticles um, to a to a cell type, right? Um, and then of course, obviously, putting it all together and showing that it works. So um, I think there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of cool parts coming together in this paper um, that is very exciting and um, uh, I look forward to seeing you know in kind of future iterations of this technological platform and seeing you know how it's how it's being applied because it certainly seems to have a very broad applicability um, and particularly with targeting senescent cells, you know, when they mention that you don't want to really be knocking down fibroblasts permanently, um, the same thing applies to senescent cells, right? And they, they might have a role in, in wound healing. So, you know, it, it's sort of like a senolytic. You want to, you know, these, these cells could be used to basically go in and the messenger RNA sort of, depending on how stable it is, what sort of variant you use, it sort of, it gets diluted away, right? It gets degraded after a certain period of time. There's a half-life to it. Um, so, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I look forward to seeing this being used, you know, on various senescent cells and seeing, you know, seeing what, what kind of, what, what, what happens. Yeah. So fibrosis is an interesting target because aside from like acute cardiac events, there's lots of tissues that just have some degree of aging associated fibrosis, right? Like lots of tissues mm -hmm. just gradually become a little more fibrotic. Um, mm -hmm. But we were talking about how there's a sort of lung tissue, right? Yeah. 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 Um, but we, we were talking about how like the stuff, these sort of vec therapies wind up in the liver. I, I kind of wonder if you could riff off this and try to make some sort of CAR T that tries to act against steatosis. 
Um, cause that's a thing that's associated with the aging liver, um, where you get a gradual accumulation of fat and mm. I don't know what you'd need to do to like, if, like what, what's the fat equivalent for adipocytes. Um, right. but I kind of wonder if you could just have an analogous therapy that takes advantage of the fact that you're going to the liver anyway, and then targets the cells that you probably don't want there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's so many, so many potentialities here, right? So, I mean, you know, CAR T cell therapy has been used to target, again, primarily cancers, different types of cancers. Um, but this is sort of like, you know, CAR T cell light. It's not, they're not genetically modified. They're, I mean, with messenger RNA, not permanently genetically modified. So you have, you have a much more control over it, right? The, you know, once you put the cells into a, a body, you can rest assured that most, if not all, are going to kind of go away unless you basically repeat this, this lipid nanoparticle treatment. Um, so I think this gives us a lot more flexibility to targeting various cells. I mean, I don't know much about cardiovascular disease, but maybe you can modify, you know, other cells, you know, to phagocytose, you know, um, plaques in your cardiovascular tissue, right? Maybe you can, you, you know, to basically make them more hyper aware of, you know, of, of, of uh, fatty deposits, um, obviously fibrotic tissue in this case, senescent cells, right? So how far can you basically push this, this, you know, this sort of this, uh, this technology into different cell types, right? And, and, and of course, we're talking about have modifying T cells and other immunological cells, and, and there's potentially other immunological cells that, you know, like macrophages that you can probably modify. I don't, I don't know. Um, but, uh, I'm just wondering now thinking out loud, like what else you can apply this technology to rather than activation of the immune system, um, you know, to, uh, to have health benefits in general, um, you know, to improve longevity or, or otherwise. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of potential here for doing a lot of cool things again. I'm not going to say that this is like the, the modular CRISPR-Cas9 version of cell-based therapy, but it, it, it seems really cool and modular. This is kind of a technical question, but do you have any idea how big of a cargo you can fit in an LNP? Um, good question. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, that's, that's something we can probably quickly Google and pull up. Obviously, there's a, there's a size before before this thing starts to kind of starts to you know pinch off and flop around and, and break and bleb right there there's obviously there's got to be a, a size to um um to it but um well I know, I know cargo size is limiting for a lot of viral vectors and i'm wondering if lnps can handle or handle bigger cargos yeah according according to according to wikipedia the first thing that came up with solid lipid nanoparticles um are between 10 and a thousand nanometers. So anyway, but um, that's a solid lipid nanoparticle. So um, it's a pretty broad range. Um, if I could look up, uh, let's see, I don't know what the, what the Moderna and the Pfizer lipid nanoparticle sizes are. Um, that's just an average size between 10 and a thousand nanometers um, synthesis, you know? So let's say a hundred nanometers. Um, So if it's a hundred nanometers, what's the size of a adenovirus? I feel like so, I should know that. <laughs> um, so, if, so structure, yeah, medium uh, size, ninety to one hundred nanometers. So it's about the same size range of lipid as adenoviruses, which are kind of like right in the middle of the range of, you know plus or minus an order of magnitude. So kind of right smack dab in the middle of, of lipid nanoparticles about the size of adenoviruses. Okay, so presumably all other things being equal, you think you'd be able to deliver cargos of similar size. Mm -hmm. I would think so, yeah. And, and probably even a bit bigger if it, if it can go up to a thousand and you could so stabilize it, right? So, so, so let's say at least the size of an adenovirus. Yeah, so and I, so that's cool because then I think about can you deliver like fancy stuff like 
like the prime editing systems where you have mm -hmm. like your whole CRISPR Cas9 plus some odds and ends to try to do very specific gene edits. Um, or maybe some CAR T system where you maybe have two receptors that act in combination to give you greater specificity. Um, when you, yeah, when you that, have some more, when you have more space to work with, you can start doing some really interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah, we're now getting into, we're now getting into laying down a theoretical framework for how you can potentially now genetically modify most, if not all cells in situ in an organism, right? In a, in a tailor way, in tailor-made fashion. Um, you know, given obviously efficiency of targeting and all of that, but theoretically it's possible. Um, so, you know, obviously that opens up a lot of, a lot of possibilities. Um, of course, steps first, short steps first, but certainly it's, it's, it's now theoretically possible. If you, if you mentioned you can put, put, put the CRISPR editing system and de derivatives thereof into it and, um, yeah, there's a whole lot you can do. I mean, it, it kind of makes you wonder how far you can push this technology. Like, there's in this paper, they've got their anti their anti CD5 an antibodies, but there's nothing super special about CD5. You could imagine mm -hmm. antibodies that are specific to any other surface protein. Right, right, exactly. Um, so yeah, um, this is yeah. I think this is very cool. <laughs> is the is the short answer? I think it's a really really cool. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's probably, I would say, you know, this is the coolest applied technology paper I have read thus far on Journal Club. Um, we've done, we've done Chris, obviously, you know, besides CRISPR-Cas9, which is pretty damn cool and won Nobel prizes, but we'll have to see, we'll have to see how this, how this technology, this technological platform pans out. Obviously CAR T cells themselves, that technology is super cool. So this is sort of, this is enhancing that. So, um, so in a sense, I like uh, it, this is to me like the cell version of CRISPR-Cas9 because you, you have a targeting technology here that's being used on a cellular level, but this is sort of a, 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 a also a really really nice unique modification of the CAR T cell technology itself. So um, uh, anyway, I don't know. Anybody have any more comments? Um, yeah, I like this a lot. Yeah, I'm going to be watching to see what this lab does next. Yeah, because you know it's 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 really it's really cool to to do an applications paper where you read it and you're excited and you start to then then you start to think your creative juices start to flow. It's like, hmm, how, how else can I apply this? You know, so I you know I'm 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 kind of not even like joking, right? I can see a lot of papers coming out of this in many other labs applying basically because it's so modular, right? You put a different receptor on the lipid nanoparticle, you target it to something else. You make a different CAR T cell, you know, uh, protein that targets a different type of, you know, cell surface uh, marker. Um, and, you know, so you can, you can, you could, it, there's a huge modularity to this, right? And the fact that these are lipid nanoparticles, it, it cuts out a lot of the processing that needs to take place, especially if people have to work with, you know, mice is a model organism, you're, you're not extracting cells and doing it in vitro and putting it back, you're, you're injecting this directly into the mouse and, and, then, and then assaying it. Cool. Hey, Didier, how's it going? Uh, so may I ask if, uh, a short question? Yeah. Yeah, so sorry for the noise here. <laughs> Uh, just, uh, well, it's the kind of question I'm always asking and sorry if you already answered because I had uh, some technical problems and so on, but um, this uh, very interesting uh, thing, it, uh, was it tested on, uh, let's say, long term, so uh, keeping uh, mice alive to see uh, what are the results after a while? Or I don't like think always so. it's just, uh, just because you, for me, all these uh, promising experiments, it's kind of a mystery. Why, uh, why do they kill the mice or the rats so very fast and don't they take a look uh, longer? Because, uh, well, the, the final goal is to make people living longer. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's a great question. And I think there's going to be a lot of, if she's in, if she's in a room. Sorry, that was somebody at the door. Um, so, uh, 
That's a great question. I don't think they did. I think I think this is a, a short term looking at basically um, heart fibrosis. So um, that's why I think there's a lot of potential here for people to jump on this and do those experiments here um, and see basically if you know um, if clearance of other types of cells is going to um, is going to positively or negatively affect the long term lifespan of of these of these mice. So you know um, because. Sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting because for, for me, the mystery is even bigger concerning senolytics. You know, there is still nothing concerning or long term, or I think there is one experiment or something like that. So there are so many uh, enthusiast articles, but nothing concerning uh, really longevity of mice and rats, and uh, even less for humans, of course. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, no, I, no, I agree. I mean, obviously, the, the, the problem with that is waiting for the results of those experiments. Um, you can cut corners and use short-lived mice, but then of course that's, people are gonna say that that's not gonna be a good result because you're using mice that are short-lived to begin with. So you're gonna have to use long, normal-lived mice and it's gonna take a couple of years. And um, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I interrupt you again, sorry, mm -hmm. but yes, they, they, they use short-life mice, but yeah, mice are already short-life, so they should only take uh, old mice uh, or old rats, and then they just need a few uh, months and they have the answer to their questions. And senolytics, they are trying with senolytics already uh, well, at mm -hmm. least two or three years. So all these mice would be alive or dead. Don't, so, yeah. I, I really uh, don't understand. Yeah, so that's, that's a good point. You could start with an older mouse, especially with senolytics, um, and see if see if the, the curve goes longer, right? Do it at the tail end. Um, and uh, I don't know, off the top of my head, um, DDA, you seem to suggest that nobody's done those end of kind of end of life experiments with mice. Um, and I'm not familiar either. Um, usually you start these, well. Um, I think there was one thing. Uh, or, or two or three, maybe one was giving the good results and one or two bad results. If if Sen is still here, he knows a lot more. So, but not many actually. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, this, I mean, basically, I mean, that's yeah, that that like you said, that's it's a it's in in practice and, and in theory and, and in practice, it should be a pretty straightforward experiment, ex series of experiments to do. Um, basically, repeat what was done in this paper, but with old mice. Right. I mean, you're going to have more fibrotic tissue in, in older mice and just, just repeat the experiment. And do you basically do you get a younger, healthier heart in an old mouse using this this targeted approach of, of fibrotic cells? Right. Um, so that that should be that should be pretty. Um, replicable, right? We should be, we should be able to, we should be able to, to do those experiments. I mean, obviously we, we could do those experiments. Not me well, now. D DDA's idea of, of targeting senescent cells is very interesting, but in order for this to work, we would need a unique surface marker on those cells. And I don't know if, if that exists. Does anybody else? Well, you know, obviously the, the other paper used a not really quite a unique one, right? They used the what was it the beta two microglobulin? The the MHC was an MHC one, I think. The MHC one subunit um, that was overexpressed on most cells, um, but that's that's not unique. It's just kind of was higher levels on senescent cells, according to that paper. And then I think right, we we don't want to kill all of the fibroblasts, as I mentioned before. Yeah. We only would want to kill senescent ones or fibrotic ones. Yeah, so so I, I don't I don't know if there's any anybody's identified a a unique senescent cell marker that's only found on all senescent cells or at least a subset of senescent cells. Um, they have yes, do they, Steve? What was that? Well, um, I think oisin, ocean, ocean, o ocean. Yeah, they uh, I think have got a unique marker. So they say and. Siwa, uh, did, did S -I -W -A. they say what, um, they say what it was? I, I believe Ocean is looking at nuclear markers, not surface mm. markers. Oh, is it? Uh, but Siwa, they, they seem to think that the, the, they found um, markers for cancer and senescence. Siwa is, 
for anybody not familiar, they are probably the oldest analytics company um, in in this particular area. Um, they've been around for a long time, but there's a um, there was a presentation at one of, one of their conferences. I think it might have been last year, where um, I think his name's Gruber. Um, he gave a talk about what C was doing, and they 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 very are, they are very affirmative that they have found a unique surface marker. So I mean, make that of uh, what you will. Whether you know whether they're uh, being truthful or not, but I think they've got some publications. Um, but I I don't have them to hand at the moment. But if you do look at uh, back at some of the uh, Erd videos, I I can't remember if it was last year, Oliver, or the year before, but uh, Gru Gruber was actually one of the speakers and he was talking about it. So they think they can do a double whammy. They can do. Uh, they think they've got a fairly generic cancer thing. And also something for senescent cells. So, just just food for thought. But let's see the results. Yeah, in that case, uh, DDA's idea could be very promising. So yeah, it's uh, S I W A C W A. But they've, um, I mean, they they have been around for a long time because Reason talks about them way back. So they are probably, I would say, the first analytics company. Mm. Not the best known, but probably the first. Uh, Let's see if I can find that. I'm just wondering, is anybody, is there ever, can't, I guess I can't find it here. Um, I'm just wondering if, Anybody won the Nobel Prize for, for CAR T therapy? Um, I don't think so. I wonder if it's one of those fields where there's many, many iterative discoveries were made. So it was kind of hard to give it to. Well, it's also fairly recent. And it may be that the Nobel Committee takes a few years or decades to pick somebody. Well, maybe, but you know, they they certainly gave it out already to um, to uh, you know the inventors of uh, of uh, CRISPR Cas9 and you know CAR T cell therapy. I believe, I think if we pull up a review paper on it, I think it's being used at least in a dozen different cancers, um, like out of the clinical trials. So usually when something goes into the clinic and doctors start to use it and it becomes a therapy. That's when, that's when the Nobel Prize in medicine or physiology bells start to ring. Um, but I couldn't, I just kind of quickly Googled CAR T therapy and Nobel. I just didn't, uh, didn't, didn't find anything. I think uh, um, unless it was, uh, unless it was in, in kind of a, it's under a different, uh, different name or different terminology. Um, but yeah, anyway, um, which is just now it strikes me, it's kind of weird, right? I mean, if it's such a breakthrough, you know, it is a breakthrough um, therapy, right? Like if it hasn't been awarded a Nobel prize, unless it's, again, I mean, usually they'll, they'll, they'll find somebody who did most of the, at least clone the first or base clone the first um, chimeric antigen receptor, right? Like somebody, somebody had to be the first one to clone the chimeric, make a chimeric, the, the first iteration. Somebody had to make version 1.0 and publish a paper on it, right? So that would, the Nobel Prize would go to that person or that person's lab. So, um, so it seems yeah. inevitable that eventually someone's going to get award, rewarded for that. Right. I mean, I, it just seems so obvious. But anyway, um, what are they waiting for? I mean, it's already, I think it's already been used to cure some cancers. A lot of cancers. So, um, and now, and now we, we have a paper that's iterating on the CAR T cell process, right? So, so, um, so yeah, very cool. Um, I think it's, yeah, very, very, very cool technology. I know I keep repeating myself, but um, I'm excited. Um, you know, this definitely, this definitely has a potential to go to, you know, assuming, 
I mean, all of these parts have already been tested. That's another cool thing, right? They're already, people have used CAR T-cell technology. People use lipid nanoparticles in humans right now through the vaccines. People use messenger RNA technology. So all of these things have been already applied in humans and patients, like many people. So this is just putting it together in a kind of a unique iteration. Um, so I, I, can, I can imagine clinical trials happening pretty quickly with, with several iterations of, of this. So, so that's, that's, that's another cool thing um, that's uh, about this, because I think I, it, can, it, can be, it can start being readily applied in, in clinical trials. Um, so um, I've got nothing else to say. Um, I think, you know, we can certainly wring out more information from this paper, but I think, uh, I think, I think, uh, I think I will be looking forward to more uh, modified CAR T cell type, um, you know, papers and, uh, um, and maybe not even T cell, there might be other immunological cells that could be modified in, in this way. To, to do other do other sorts of things, um, glial cells in the brain, perhaps to basically scavenge beta amyloid plaques, improve their improve their functionality. I don't know. Um, improve the ability for some some cells, immunological cells, to cross the blood brain barrier. I don't know. Um, I mean, let's think about it. There's a there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, imaginative, um, you know, uh, experimentation that can take place here. Okay, that is that is all I have to say. <laughs> I'll I'll eat, leave everybody with these with these. So, do you know if you have free time, you know, engage in some thought experiments. Experiments. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Thank you, Oliver. <clears throat> Thanks, Oliver. And Thank, Thank you, you guys. Thanks uh, everybody for joining uh, me. Just Steve, can you send to me what you were saying at one uh, the, the last thing uh, because I I couldn't take note. Thanks a lot. Um, it was it was a name. Oh, um, that, that you were spelling. Oh, he... is there a replay available on Facebook? Thank you. There you go. It was Lewis uh, Gruber uh, at Seaworth. Thank you. Um, we did an interview with him as well. Thank you. So, um, I just checked the interview, Oliver, and they don't disclose um, what the surface marker is, but they say that they've got um, a surface marker for senescent cells and cancer cells. So I don't think they're the same one, obviously, but um, they, they talk about it. And I know that we've got... Um, a talk from last year's conference um so i'm pretty sure we haven't published it yet because i can't find it on our playlists so i know that we're down to the last few and um hopefully we can uh, get that out there but uh, yeah keep an eye on siwa they are potentially doing interesting stuff but obviously the proof of the pudding there is in the eating as they say so can can they uh, can they do it I certainly hope so. Or, or in this context, the tragocytosin, yeah? The proof, oh God, no. I'm not even gonna make a, a biology analogy of this. The proof of the, proof of the autophagy, autophagy is in the I, eating. I have to say that word several times so, so I don't stumble across it because it's the first time tragocytosin has ever, ever left my mouth. I've never... <laughs> Uh, other than this journal club. Well, it took me ages to say autophagy. Eh, whatever, you know. Sometimes I still say autophagy because, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just a barbarian. Anyway, you, you all know what Just I mean. to be stubborn. Yeah, but... I could say autophagy because it sounds a, a bit British, isn't it? Well, I pronounce, I pronounce... Apoptosis, apoptosis. I don't care what anybody else pronounces. It. I'm going. Uh, goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Enjoy. Bye, DJ. Well, it is apoptosis or apoptosis. I, I don't want like apoptosis. Both, both pronunciations are used by different um, uh, researchers in the field. There's a group at University of Michigan that uh, 
uses autophagy, for example, and uh, and uh, then at um, Albert Einstein, they all always say autophagy, and uh, so I think take your pick, use either one. I'm going to use both. There you go, guys. Referee rules. Referee rules that no violation. So there you go. But I once, but, but once, but once you choose one pronunciation, you could never collaborate with that other lab ever again. That's the rule. Oh, I don't know about <laughs> that. I don't know. I'm far too fickle to stick to one thing for very long, Oliver. So there you go. There you go. Right. Well, that was an interesting uh, paper. So big things ahead, maybe for that. Mm -hmm. We have talked. I mean. You alluded to it earlier, but we've talked about using uh, modified immune cells as a way of uh, hunting down uh, senescent cells. Uh, Alexander Stoltzin has talked about it about four years, five years ago. Um, it's, it's great to see that that sort of thing is now starting to come to light because, mm -hmm. you know, what's the best sort of drug, living adaptable drug that we've got? Yes, that's right. It's your immune system. So I can't understand why we're not actually using these great workhorses um, a lot more and, and, you know, and doing things like that, along with things like modifying macrophages uh, to clean up cellular junk. Yes, I'm, I'm looking at you, uh, Reason, from uh, Repair Biotechnologies. And of course, the mighty underdog, the Send spin-off, are also uh, working in that sort of area too. So, yeah. I, I'm, I'm actually pretty um, enthusiastic about uh, modifying our own immune cells and, and using them. And I'm, I'm sensing you are as well, Oliver. Mm -hmm. you, were, you, were, you were trying hard not to get too excited earlier. I could see it. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, it is, is exciting. Quite key. Is that quite key? Nope. All right. Well, um, thanks, everybody, I guess. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, as always, for your contributions here. Oh, and Jesus. And thank you. Thank Fatima you. Fatima in the background and everybody else who's joined us, DDA, from, from, from his um, gambling expedition in oh, Dubai, whatever. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't think know. It, was, no, uh, it doesn't work. His, 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 his high stakes back <laughs> rat table that he was broadcasting. <laughs> I don't think he was a uh, uh, gambling. He's not the sort of uh, person. I don't uh, think really. That's that's a joke. I know. I, I know. Works. You're playing roulette though with uh, with that. That's a serious accusation where I come from. Anyway, on that uh, on that note, we'll take a we're going to take a gamble, aren't we? And uh, uh, on next month's paper, maybe. Yeah. I'm sure um, we'll. Uh, I'm sure we'll come up uh, trumps with something. Yeah, and if anybody here has any ideas for papers, please send it over because I, you know, otherwise we're just we're just picking them. Uh, and this happened to be a really good paper, and I enjoyed the last paper too because that was a that was a that was a these kind of tie together. Last paper, as as you recall, we talked about um, uh, what did we talk about we talked about COVID, and we talked about what predisposes aged cells to COVID. And, and this has got a COVID connection because it's lipid nanoparticles, which are being utilized in, in, um, in our, um, you know, our state-of-the-art vaccines. So, so um, you know, uh, maybe the other paper we pick next month is not going to be as directly COVID related, but, um, but there you have it. Yeah, we don't want to do, uh, we don't want to do too much about that. I think people have got COVID uh, fatigue and you know it, it is a little bit outside their wheelhouse for the most so apart from the rna technologies um mm -hmm. obviously they're extremely relevant to what we're doing um and as i've said before they could be adapted rna technology um to uh, do all sorts of things in in our field so on that respect i actually think covid in that in that respect is greatly accelerated um progress so yeah actually yeah would you want to talk about one of those uh immunotolerizing lipid nanoparticle papers i'm not aware of those the immunotolerizing uh it's well, i can if I, I can i can dig up some links for you but the yeah. uh, the notion is so think mrna vaccine but you deliver it to dendritic cells 
and you trigger regulatory T's instead of killer T's, so you get the reverse effect. Um, the the upshot is really cool because you could, in theory, um, prevent autoimmune diseases that way. And yeah, that that is that is actually cool. Or 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 severe allergies, reversing allergic response, right? Potentially, yep. and uh, that is uh, that is really. Yeah, that's really, uh, really cool. Yeah, um, I'm just trying to th think what else is there or anything that basically, um, can this be used somehow to squelch like also like inflammatory responses that are happening? I mean, that's where my mind wanders too. Down downgrade, you know, uh, what's, the, what's the term, um, inflammaging in a sense i don't know um uh yeah yeah do send some links over that would be I'll see if I can find a good one it, to look at it from the other kind of the other angle the other perspective guys are so nerdy <laughs> knowing all this like obscure stuff so oh, i yeah. knew there was a reason we kept you around so uh <laughs> no i mean that's that is yeah immune, immunomodulation that's um didn't, didn't even occur to me but um, but yeah, that is yeah. Yeah, I think I think in general we're probably gonna I, you know again this this CAR T cell technology with the lipid nanoparticle modification in situ is pretty awesome. But then using the lipid nanoparticles themselves to not just do CAR T cell in situ, but do some of these other modifications is pretty cool as well. Yeah, but I got something cooler than that. Uh, I'll send you the paper anyway because <laughs> okay. yes, I'm back right. on the um, I'm back on the reprogramming stuff again. There's been another really interesting uh, experiment where they actually uh, uh, deployed uh, Yamanaka factors in mice and demonstrably uh, showed how it it, it effectively reverses uh, at least three types of aging, like broad categories. So very interesting. We wrote about it already because we just couldn't wait. Um, I think it's a preprint. So the caveat is obviously it's a preprint, but it's just too exciting not to write about now rather than wait a couple of months um, and then write about it when it's fully published because uh, all the other outlets would have already rushed and covered it and we don't get the scoop. So there you go. That's the world of journalism for you. I'll send you the paper, see what you think, uh -huh. but... I honestly think it's pretty darn significant. Um, again, epigenetic reversal, Yamanaka factors, spurs rejuvenation, and re, uh, rewinds all sorts of aging markers. If that's not exciting, I don't know what's going to get you out of bed in the morning. Is, is it this great. Antoine's paper? Is this the one from Calico? Uh, no. I knew he was going to ask that. Why didn't I look? <laughs> Jam, jam, jam all that into a lipid targeted lipid nanoparticle, and we have a file. Oh, here paper. we go. Here we go. It's actually just published. Cellular reprogramming rejuvenates multiple organs in mice. We've just released that on our website. And is that not? Is that uh, it? Is not behind a paywall? No, it'll be on the preprint server. If it's a preprint, if it's the one I'm thinking of. Hang on, I've got to find the paper. He list the paper. Wow. No, so you'll just have to read the read the news article. Uh, there you go. You heard it here first, but it is multiple tissue, and there is a link in it to the paper. I don't know why they haven't cited that. I should be having words with uh, the news team about this. This is unacceptable. But anyway, there's the paper. Have a look. Enjoy. Get excited. I think he's excited. Uh, even Reasons on Fight Agent is moderately excited about uh, partial cellular reprogramming. So if Reasons moderately excited, that's probably quite exciting. I'm excited, guys. Cool. And I just can't hide it. Anyway. <laughs>
<laughs> oh dear. On that note, <laughs> okay. On that <laughs> terrible note, before someone bursts into song, um, we will see you all next time, and we will talk about reprogramming and reversing aging. Maybe if Oliver is titillated suitably by that paper. Okay. And we will. Uh, I guess we'll see you next time. Thanks for everyone that's turned up uh, on Facebook and uh, got involved, and everybody here today as well, our lifespan heroes. And if you'd like to join us, why not become a lifespan hero yourself? And you can find out more by visiting lifespan.io forward slash heroes. There you go. We'll see you all next time. All right, everybody. Take Thank care. You. See Bye, you all everyone. soon.